Throughout the Cold War, we were fed many half-truths from both the anti-nuclear movement and the nuclear industry. Many of us had no idea what nuclear weapons or nuclear energy was, but we were led to believe that they were a great danger to us all. News flashes of Chernobyl and Three Mile Island only increased this fear of this mysterious substance. sort of children's story book put it. It was going to give us uh, unlimited supplies of power. Uh, it was going to end our uh, reliance on oil. Uh, it was going to have us colonizing the moon and, and uh, living uh, in a world without want of energy. It's not surprising that nuclear energy is associated with hope. It, it comes out of an era, you know, that post-Second World War era where we had tremendous optimism that science and technology was going to be able to be used to, sol to solve so many human problems, um, to elevate the human condition, make life easier for us. Really, for most people, uh, energy is something that's simply given, something that most of us don't think about. And it undermines our ability to make wise choices about the direction we should be taking on, on energy if we don't in fact know what the foundations are for energy use in our society. The physicists are, are really live in fantasy land. Faith, hope and trust and a little sprinkling of pixie dust. Faith that we won't have a meltdown. Faith we won't release lots of isotopes as we repower the plant, but they always do. Faith that the public won't find out the evil that they're up to. Faith that there won't be a major accident. Faith that they will find the answer to the storage of radioactive waste for a million years. And they've been saying they can find it for 40 years. Nuclear energy has an eerie component to it. It involves something that we can't see and that we can't really intuitively understand. The way that we understand, for example, coal, that we understand fire, that we understand gasoline, um, but we don't quite understand how nuclear energy works. It takes place on a level that uh, sort of transcends uh, the manual capacity of the mind, and it enters into a hidden world. Nuclear energy has a long and complex history. It goes back actually to the 19th century when people first started to think about the power within the atom. And scientists at the time and the journalists made a great to-do about it, as if uh, there were some kind of magical, mystical, supernatural force of nature, completely uncanny and different from anything that was known before. Now, actually, of course, nuclear energy isn't any more uncanny than the forces, the chemical forces that we have when we strike a match. Once upon a time, there was a kingdom where People had gotten used to using a lot of energy, and one day a fellow came along and offered them a goose. And this is the story of the goose that laid the toxic egg. Now, this goose was a marvelous goose. Um, you just had to feed it a very small amount of stuff, and it would produce feathers that you could use to produce energy, and, and there was the rumor of this incredible golden egg that would follow. But there was one problem with this goose. It only ate a little bit, but it shit a lot. And this shit was incredibly toxic. But people were ex so excited that this goose's feathers would provide energy and the promise of the golden egg that they didn't worry about the shit. They just said, we'll deal with that later. And long after the goose died, the shit was still around, dangerously causing cancer and birth defects and genetic damage to people's chromosomes and the rest of the, the environment. And so that to me is the, the parable of nuclear power. And in so doing, it creates uh, stuff that we associate, this is nuclear waste, with uh, pestilence, with uh, disease, or rotting from within. And it's something that uh, we will always have to live with in the lifetimes of uh, generations that go on exponentially after us. 
you know, we were hearing about the, the challenge for my generation was going to be what we were going to do with all of our leisure time. Because we were going to be working, you know, five, ten hours a week. And so, because science and technology were going to miss make our lives so abundant. Well, of course, I can tell you that's not the case. And I don't know of anyone who's working those, those kind of hours. So, there was a, a, nuclear energy was associated with that kind of optimism. You know, it was the new science. It was going to bring this brave new world. And it hasn't panned out that way. Early on, began to fear the nuclear reactors would blow up like atomic bombs. Now they, they can't do that at all, but still the whole idea of a reactor is sort of a little atomic bomb. With all that goes along with atomic bombs, because atomic bombs mean not just blowing things up, they mean the end of the world, they mean radioactive monsters coming out of the desert, uh, giant ants, all sorts of fearsome creatures. Now, of course, radioactivity won't actually make insects giant. If anything, it'll make them sick and small. But the idea that there was this tremendous power within nuclear energy was translated into the idea of giant insects, giant crabs, giant people. Uh, everything was somehow more powerful if it had radioactivity in it. And they fear it because they've been told to fear it. The media. Um, over the course of the last 50 years has focused on radiation. Uh, we've all grown up knowing people who believe that radiation causes mutations. Ninja Turtles, uh, the Spider-Man, all of those movies and, and uh, Hollywood creations, um, all of them were involved uh, with radiation or exposure to radiation. When none of that could occur, but it, yet it was such an entertainment value that we have been told and we all believe instinctively that radiation causes these bad things. We cannot allow fear to command our judgment any longer. The choices we made in the past will have real consequences for many generations to come. I now realize that our perception of nuclear waste was nothing more than a fictitious monster rooted in fear rather than fact. How can we reconcile these differences? Do we want to live in fear of the unknown? We create um, artificial radioactive uh, radioactivity all the time in an x-ray machine. Uh, the old-fashioned cathode ray tubes in a television set put out a lot of radiation in x-ray form. Um, so we can create radioactive materials and when we make them as a material itself, as a, a substance that is itself radioactive, it decays away over a, what is known as its half-life. Some radioactive substances have short half-lives, some have long half-lives. So radioactivity in the material behind me is from plutonium, which was used in nuclear weapons, and it has a half-life of 24,000 years. So 10 times the half-life, over a quarter of a million years, is how long this material will take to effectively decay away to lead. So in a quarter of a million years, I'll be sitting, I would be sitting next to a, a pile of lead. Well, when we talk about nuclear waste, we really have to talk a lot about the perception that people have, not just of nuclear waste, but of radiation as a general. And, and there is a huge, a huge stigma and, and aura and, 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 and almost uh, uh, hatred of nuclear things and fear of nuclear things. So, first of all, any energy system at the scale at which humans now use energy has pretty profound risks. So, it is not meaningful to say there are some risks unless you say something about how big they are in numbers that really matter, like number of people who die per kilowatt hour or what have you, or you compare them to risks of other technologies, it's meaningless. So for nuclear power, the big risks that people talk about are reactor risks, the risk that a reactor will catastrophically melt down in some way, release reactivity, the risk of weapons proliferation, the, the link to nuclear weapons, uh, risks associated with extracting the fuel and making the, the making the fuel, the fuel cycle, and then risks on the back end of waste disposal. So that's the sort of range of risks, and for each of those you can compare them to the risks of other technologies, except maybe the weapons risk, which is really unlike any other. Well, first of all, one of the myths is belied by the fact that I'm sitting here in front of stacks of um, uh, highly radioactive waste. Um, I am protected by the nature of the radiation itself. 
Um, the radiation in those barrels would be harmful if I ingested it or I inhaled it, but I'm not going to put my head in the drums. I am going to stay outside of the range of that radiation and be safe. Nuclear power in its operating mode that we have has been much safer than other ways we have of making electricity. Uh, and that tr is true even when one counts the big accidents that have happened, including Fukushima and Chernobyl. So if you look at the actual data of, of what the um, impacts have been to human health or to climate change, uh, the risks are low. If nuclear energy harnesses the power of nature and is based upon the laws and principles of physics, how could it possibly be a monster? We were a society of progress, with a religious focus on growth before everything else. We warned ourselves plenty of times that this growth would have a cost, but our need for progress was often far too great for us to heed these warnings. With a need for cheap and abundant energy, we learned how to split the atom and heralded a new and exciting age of growth and prosperity. Uh, because we have engineering methods and because we know a lot about geology, we can select um, systems, disposal systems, that can effectively demonstrate, um, essentially guarantee that this material will not get out if left undisturbed. What we have is, uh, is nuclear power, uh, which is expensive, very expensive to, uh, to generate, and it also creates uh, large amounts of waste, and uh, this is a one of the insoluble problems of nuclear power. So the record is mixed and the experts uh, have no consensus. They say, trust us, we're good scientists, we'll find the cure. And that's like me saying to a patient, you've got pancreatic cancer, you probably die in about six months, but trust me, I'm a really good doctor and in 20 years time I'll find the cure. Deciding what to do with this waste taught us that we could no longer buy into the illusion that we could hold nature's most powerful force in the palm of our hand. For your sake and the sake of your children, we needed to find a way to protect you from what we created. We'll use nuclear fuel, which is the material that NW most has to manage, is the, is the waste product from a nuclear power station. After the fuel bundles are put into the reactor, they uh, generate energy which causes heat, which turns a, a steam turbine, which uh, produces electricity. But after about 18 months, those fuel bundles are no longer efficient source of, of energy for that process, and they're removed. When they are removed from the reactor, they uh, have two properties that um, require us to really think hard and manage them very carefully. One is that they're, they're very hot, uh, but the other is that there's a radiation emitting from it. It's potentially hazardous to people in the environment if it's not managed carefully. And the nature of the hazard is that it's hazardous for hundreds of thousands of years. So the challenge for Canadians and for society is how to manage this used nuclear fuel in a way that um, contains and isolates it from people in the environment and is respectful of, of all the generations to come. The Government of Canada struck the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, an organization that is controlled by appointees from those provinces that have nuclear power plants, Ontario, Quebec, uh, New Brunswick. That organization uh, is trying to find a technologically viable, commercially affordable solution to the disposal of waste. They have a huge problem ahead of them. Uh, humanity has not been able in the past to solve a problem that involves storing something stably for 100,000 years or more, ensuring that it doesn't contaminate the, the wider environment, uh, the jury is out as to whether or not they will be able to find a technique that is in fact going to protect humanity and the environment for hundreds of centuries. Nuclear wastes really aren't that different from other wastes in society. I mean, the long-lived things, uh, when they say, say, well, nuclear waste has to be looked after, put away forever, 
And it does. I mean, the, the high-level stuff does need to be dealt with for a long, long time, say effectively forever. But it's the same with regular waste that society deals with. Arsenics, cyanides, mercury metals, cadmium, all those things last forever. And, and they also need to be, should be dealt with like this. I mean, the public could just as easily have had this fixation and fear of those materials, but they don't. We deal with those actually by burying them on surface landfills, which is incredible. And yet here, for some materials of similar length and toxicity of time, although you know different kinds of toxicity through this uh, radiation, the, the public is, is scared skinny, and, and it, it just doesn't make sense because they're proposing to dispose of these long-lived waste deep underground, and yet things that are of similar uh, impact and of which are much larger volumes, much, much larger, uh, thousands of times more volumes of these hazardous wastes in, in society are dealt with just by putting them into surface landfills where they're exposed to erosion and other things. The method that we are pursuing in Canada for the long-term management of used nuclear fuel includes two components, uh, a technical component and the management system. From a, a technical point of view, the ultimate objective is to uh, isolate and contain used nuclear fuel in a deep geological repository in a suitable uh, geological formation. Uh, the fuel will be uh, monitored and it will remain retrievable for an extended period of time. It is important because it is an ethical uh, issue and it is a moral obligation. Uh, used fuel right now is safely managed in surface facilities around the world and uh, all these facilities are licensed and they, are, they have an excellent uh, safety record. However, the fuel that is on, on the surface requires maintenance. The containers that are used uh, are not long-lived containers. The, their lifespan is maybe 50 to 100 years, so they will need active maintenance. And the hazard that is associated with used fuel is a long-term one. Radioactivity will be there for hundreds of thousands of years. You put the material into the earth. The earth is essentially an imperfect container. It has cracks. Okay? Material moves. Uh, the earth doesn't stand still. Uh, so I'd rather have some uh, mechanical object that we can watch and we can replace, uh, and I feel safer doing that than, than putting it in, in an imperfect container, which is the earth. So the way they're talking about disposing of nuclear waste deep underground, and it's not just gonna be thrown down there in liquid form, they're going down there in solid form, they're gonna be encapsulated in cement or, or in, 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 in bentonite clays and things like that. It's a state of the art, nothing else in society, no other toxic materials, hazardous materials, are being dealt with at that, that high of a level. Everything else has been dealt with much more casually. And actually, if anything, you know, the nuclear waste disposal programs are setting the way. They're setting the pattern for what should be done, how we should be dealing with all wastes. You know, people are, are, are somehow are, are, are very worried about it.